attack up in Oklahoma, and Gary and I were talking about it, and I just forgot to announce that, but I do appreciate the fact that you included that in your prayers. So let's all remember Roger Bentley in our personal prayers, and hopefully that his father will not be uh, very serious in this matter. Uh, I want to first of all introduce our four members. Hardeman Nichols was supposed to be one of those members. He probably got caught in the traffic somewhere, I would just assume. Uh, but we have two great men here. And if they can't answer the question, well, Brother Dave Miller's back there, Brother Robert Dodson, Brother uh, Owen Cosgrove, so we've got a lot of good men that can, but I don't doubt at all that these two men can. Brother Perry Cotham is one of the truly, truly great men of our time. This man, I don't think you'd mind me divulging, he's 89 years old. He's like the energizing battery. He just keeps on going and going and going. He just returned from the Far East, beloved. He was over there for about a month or two, I think. Uh, six, weeks. six weeks preaching and gospel meetings. Can you believe that? And he's made trip after trip after trip uh, such as that all over the world. I don't know of any man in the brotherhood who's preached in more places than Brother Perry Cotham has. He's an amazing person and knows the Bible backwards and forwards. Then Brother Gary Workman. Uh, I don't know of any preacher in the brotherhood with as keen a mind or any, any better than Gary's. He is one of the most intelligent people I know. He has such a wide uh, grasp of information at his command and always does such an excellent job. He's only exceeded by his wife, Sonny. That's, she's the only one that I know of that's smarter than he is. No, I'm just kidding. They're, they're both plenty smart, but we're glad to have Gary. Now, Brother Cotham has asked me, I wasn't intended to do this, but he's asked me to sort of uh, rephrase the question. So he's a little hard of hearing. Of course, he doesn't know that I am too. So, <laughs> so this may be real fun. But uh, uh, we're going to keep a good spirit going. Uh, if your question's a little controversial, that's fine. But let's be gentlemen about it. And let's be loving and kind in the way we uh, speak uh, back and forth to one another. We just want to learn more about God's will. That's the whole point at hand. So the forum's going to be open. Don't be bashful. Now, if you have a question, any of you men, why, why uh, ask the question. So we've got uh, two of our students with roving microphones, I trust. Where are our students? Stand up. One of you get over sort of in this way and one of you over there. And we're going to start the forum. Anybody that has a question, raise your hand. One way back the back, one right here. We've just got lots of them. Uh, please also, when you give the question, state your name, let us know who you are, where you're from, and then speak, speak distinctly right into the microphone. You're the first. My name is Dale Hull. I, I'm a, uh, from Las Vegas Trail right now. I was from Southside. <clears throat> My question is, is it scriptural, correct, approved by God, to use committees appointed by elders in the functioning of the body of the Christ. Is it scripturally all right, and I'm sort of rephrasing the question, to use committees, for the elders to use committees in the functioning of the body of Christ? Either one of you, or a particular one, which one wants to answer? You want us to Go ahead, go ahead. You're better looking. If the elders should ask certain ones to assist them uh, in the work in various ways, I don't see anything wrong in that. After all, they would have the final decision, uh, but they could uh, feel the feelings of uh, others and then weigh that and judge it. I'm thinking that you're thinking of in matters of option or expediency, judgment of that kind, certainly not in doctrine, but the other. Uh, that would be briefly as I understand your question, my answer in the matter. I don't know what may be the background of the question, of course, and I think it's possible that um, there could be situations where the elders sort of abdicated their authority in the congregation, turned it over to this and that committee and said, well, you run this and whatever you say, that's the way we're going to do it. Uh, in that kind of a case, you know, I'm, I would have a problem with it. 
Uh, I think we, we would have to compare it with um, the uh, father, husband and father in a home. He's supposed to be the head of the home, and yet uh, we um, often want input. In fact, quite frequently, maybe daily, want input from our uh, wife or our children, or as the case may be. In, uh, in our home, we had four kids, and so each child got one vote. My wife got five, and I got 10. So that way, <coughs> You know, I could have an, a committee of all of them, but I could still override everything they came up with. But I, I think that's right what Brother Cotham said. There's nothing wrong with committees any more than individuals as long as the elders are still the ones who are overseeing the flock. Very good question. Okay, you've got a question over here. Uh, does the situation in Genesis 4, 2 through 6 imply that a law concerning sacrifice was given to man prior to this time. Would you, Ron, tell us who you are and oh. repeat the question. All right, I'm Ron Suter, and I'm a, I'm a senior here at Brown Trail School of Preaching. Uh, the situation in Genesis 4, 2 through 6, where uh, Cain and Abel offer their sacrifices and God refuses Cain's, uh, does that imply that there was a law of sacrifice before this time? Did you, brethren, hear that question? I think they did. There's no use me repeating it. Well, I'll start off on that one. And uh, I want to say it's a real privilege to be up here with uh, Brother Perry Cotham, who's old enough to be my great grandfather. I thought you were, a, I thought you were 108 by now, uh, though actually. Um, Maxie, you know, I'm feeling like there's something missing here. I think we ought to invite that man back in the Brother corner. Brother Dave Miller. Brother Dave Miller, I, no, don't look at the door. I mean, you, you're right there to come Part up here not and, inside, and Dave. Come sit on in up. this chair. Um, and uh, he may, we, you know, who knows? We may get questions on Darwinism or uh, something else that we'll need him for. Um, to answer this question, um, Hebrews chapter 11 is where I would go. And uh, notice in verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he had witness born to him that he was righteous, God bearing witness in respect of his gifts, and through it he being dead yet speaketh. When somebody does something by faith, we, we need to define faith as being man's response to God's word. Now, now, it may be a promise and we believe it and therefore we have faith in that promise that God will do what he said. Or it may be a command that came from God and in that case we need to obey it. And in that case our action is a response of our faith. But faith is not opinion and, uh, or guesswork. And Hebrews 11 verse 4 cannot be rightly understood to mean that by guesswork, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. He just happened to guess which one God would want. And so I contend that the very uh, presence of the word faith here proves that God had given them instructions about what he wanted in the way of worship, or in this particular case, sacrifice. I agree with Brother Gary on that, because that's what it means, by faith. They were authorized. Go on down there. Verse 7, by faith Noah. By faith Abraham, verse 8. If you, perhaps you were not here Sunday morning when uh, Dave talked about that and showed by faith and what it meant to do it by faith, following God's instruction to doing the Lord's will. And uh, so it's implied in that expression. You want to add anything to it? Just one thing. Chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 6, uh, is where God speaks to Cain and says, if you do, I think the King James says, well, or right, will you not be accepted? That word proves there has to have been objective information for Cain to even know what right or wrong is. Ron, did that complete the, the question? All right, who's next? Uh, okay. Your name, please. My name is Jody Boren from Abilene. The subject of the Godhead is a profound and fascinating study. I've always understood that the Godhead is co-equal. That is, the, uh, the God, the Father, the Christ, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're equal. 
There does seem to be, however, a chain of command. Could you elaborate on this just a little? Any one of you that wants to answer this. It's not really a question, but I'd just like to have it expounded on a, a little more. Is there a chain of command? My brother Jody has asked a question pertaining to the Godhead, and I think all of us would quickly concur that that's a profound subject. But nonetheless, the question is, if the Godhead, the three persons of the Godhead are co-equal, then how come there appears to be, any way, uh, a chain of command, however you want to phrase it? Well, of course, we cannot fully understand the Godhead in the sense there are three and yet one. The Bible does speak of the Godhead, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the Son, or the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. But that certainly is the teaching of the Word of God. Of course, there is a religious group that say that there's only one person of the Godhead, and that's Jesus only. And, uh, and if you say, now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that's wrong, that's sinful. Well, that, uh, that to me, I wouldn't want to say that at all. But yet there's one God, and yet the one Godhead, the one eternal whatever, existing from all eternity, always was, always will be, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. I think the uh, questioner knows the answer to the question. Maxie, do you have any idea who that was asked that question? <laughs> he, looked he looks familiar, doesn't he? Um, he I think he knows uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Uh, Jody Boren has been a preacher uh, a long time, and uh, I don't know why you're asking this, Jody, uh, but... Uh, you could answer this as well as any of us. But he, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So if that verse doesn't prove a subordination of the Son to the Father, I, I don't know how much clearer it could possibly be stated. Uh, where the Holy Spirit fits into that relation is not expressed here, but um, I think it's obvious from accumulated verses that we could go to, like, uh, for example, Ephesians 1, especially toward the end of the chapter, that uh, the Father is um, all in all, and uh, the, the Supreme One, as far as position goes, in the three persons of the Godhead, and, and the others are subordinate to Him. Uh, are we answering everything you're wanting to know? I didn't know if there was something more to it. Other passages that we could look at, although I think the, the answer, as you indicate, is we, we have indications, but we can't understand it ultimately, how there could be three persons, one God. But other passages would be the statements that Jesus made while, while on earth. He said, I came to do the will of my Father. I finished the work that my Father has given me to do, which implies subordination. But in 1 Corinthians 15, you remember when it's all over, we're informed that Jesus is going to turn the kingdom back over to the Father. So that even seems to imply, you know, someone might say, well, Jesus was subordinate to the Father only in his earthly state. And he did seem to relinquish something, not his deity, but he definitely placed himself in a position where he was not um, in his uh, exalted state in eternity. For example, in Matthew 24, where um, a correct rendering says that no one knows when the end will come, not even the Son. That's an interesting statement. But uh, So I don't know that we could ultimately settle it in our own finite minds, but there are those many passages that indicate that Jesus was submissive to God. A postscript on that. Uh, did this thing go off? I guess it's still there. Um, a postscript on that. I don't know how you view that statement exactly, but, I, uh, yeah, but I've always um, felt like that that has to be understood in the context of the time in which the statement was made. In other words, does Jesus know right now when he's coming again? I rather think he does. And that in his subordinated position, even more subordinated while on earth, he, had, he gave up deity, gave up many and most of his prerogatives of deity, and therefore did not know that. But now that he is king of kings and lord of lords, I rather expect he does. I agree, but now comment for me, Gary. <clears throat> what does the 1 Corinthians 15 passage mean when it says all of this is over? Right now he's reigning at the right hand of God, right? Acts 2. He's in heaven in, at the right hand of God as if 
even in that eternal state there is a distinction but why would he turn the kingdom over to the father why would he just turn it over to himself in eternity so i don't i don't understand that if you want to comment on that well <laughs> jody can you answer that question <laughs> Uh, well, that doesn't have to anything to do with what I just no, said. That's, true. that's another. That's another Great point. point. Uh, why, in other words, why does the kingdom have to be put back into the hands of the Father if Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords right now? And if that suits the Father for it to be that way, why couldn't it just stay that way? Well, that, is that in, the question? In Matthew 24. He's admittedly in an earthly condition, but he's not now, and he right. won't be at the end of time. Right but he's still reacting to the Father as if he's a superior. That's, that's all I was saying. Let me read one passage in reference to Dave's uh, uh, mentioning 1 Corinthians 15 in verses 27 and 28 of that chapter. The Bible says, He, that is reference to the Father, put all things in subjection under his feet. So here you have God putting all things in subjection under the feet of Jesus. But when he said all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who did subject all things unto him. And when all things have been subjected unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subjected to him that did subject all things unto him, that God may be all in all. Now that surely clarifies it. <laughs> Well, I, it's profound. There's I no question. Brother Perry Cotham may have the, the best, final, best and final word on that, and I'll let him say that in just a moment if he has anything. But uh, one thing we might remember is in Ephesians 1, Paul says God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So it, it seems that, in effect, God even put the Son over himself in, 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 a, in an accommodative sense. Uh, meaning I'm going to back away and let you run everything. But in the end, the Father, whose rightful place is to do that, comes back into the picture, and the Son is then subordinated. Can I Next. say one other thing, Max? Okay, Dave wants to say something. Since we're just throwing stuff into the pot for you to go study, look at all of the times that Jesus applies Exodus 3, uh, 14 to himself. Like at the end of uh, John 8, where they said, you're not even 50 years old. What are you talking about? You've seen Abraham, or Abraham's seen you. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. I mean, that's, that's Yahweh in Exodus 3. That's the God, the Father. And yet, many times, Jesus applied that to himself. I think there are some things that we just can't fully comprehend. And the nature of the Godhead certainly ranks up there. Okay, next question. So tie that with X, or excuse me, Isaiah 9 and 6, that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and Everlasting Father. That's not the question for which I stand, although I did stand and I ask it. <laughs> Pat Andrews, San Antonio, and Maxi, I ask you a question. Since you handed me this paper about this question and you're going to repeat it, yes, sir. do I just need to carry it over there to you? Yeah, go ahead and answer, ask the question. <laughs> don't, don't call me Gordhead, just answer no. my question. Oh. So, so as you're thinking about that, is Jesus Christ as the Son of God, is he the everlasting Father as is prophetically given in Isaiah 9 and 6? He wants to know if uh, Isaiah 9 and 6 applies then to the Christ. He's asking you this question. Oh, he's asking you. <laughs> in that uh, sense, as it's been explained both by Gary and, and uh, and also, uh, Max's comment on it, certainly he is everlasting in the sense the Father of the ages or et the eternal one. And he humbled himself and became flesh and lived among men. I really think that we need to confine our questions to that which pertain to our obedience to the Lord and service to the Lord today that's pleasing to the Lord because there's something Kind of, we get off in deep water, maybe do not fully understand, well, I don't think we have to understand fully and completely uh, to obey the Lord and serve Him and to do His will. Uh, I, I just offer that suggestion also concerning the point and the question. 
might uh, throw into that answer uh, to the answer to that question, Hebrews 1.13, where uh, uh, the inspired writer has just got through saying he's not ashamed to call them brethren back in verse 11, and then verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children whom God hath given me. And so in, a, in an accommodative sense, again, uh, it, it appears that there is a father-child relationship of some sort here, not in the same sense as the f Heavenly Father is our father and we're his children, but maybe in the sense that Paul could call Timothy his child in the faith, uh, something like that, although greater than that, of course, since it has to do with the Son of God. And you have another question? Yes, I do. The microphone went away, but I'll try and project Wait until the microphone comes here. Too, you know, Christ mm -hmm. is spoken of as the eternal one uh, from everlasting to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. In, uh, in chapter 3 of Hebrews, we have the, the analogy of the father being over the house, Moses a servant in the house, but Jesus the son. So there again is that implied relationship. But I would take Isaiah 9 the same way I would take those I am passages. Jesus, Jesus shares equal divinity. But I would not push it so far as to say Jesus is the Father. That's the, um, the uh, what, Pentecostal or United Oneness, oneness notion. Yeah, there's no way you could justify yeah. that scripturally, but there is clear affiliation. While, there, while the three are one, yet there's a distinction drawn. I think we can safely say that. Where we have our problem. Wherever this is taught now. Where we have our problem with that is what I would see as we kind of... Uh, wander back and forth from polytheism to monotheism and we really don't fully understand trinity in all cases is how, where we have uh, difficulty putting that together. Leaving that behind. This was uh, handed by someone whom I do not know uh, to Maxie and he handed it to me. This is Acts 21 verses 17 through 26. Paul has arrived Jerusalem. He's talking to James and the elders there. There is a question about Paul and his uh, preaching and teaching, negative arguments about the law of Moses. Don't go back to that. Yet there is a vow that is involved there. There is uh, Paul and four others who perhaps Paul was involved with a vow, perhaps he was not. Did he? What was the vow? And why did he get involved in there? Is that tangled enough? The question pertains to the vow that is mentioned in Acts chapter 21. Have He's you asking you, wasn't he? I thought he was asking you. Didn't you have a tract on this subject or something? But I thought he said to Gary Workman on that. I'll start it off and let Perry Cotham finish it. Um, or Dave. Um, I believe that in the Bible, in not just one period of time, but in several, at least two, there are what we could genuinely call transition periods. Um, one, for example, is uh, the period between the initial preaching of John the Baptizer and the day of Pentecost. Um, I believe that those who were baptized under, under the hand of John were not reimmersed when the Christian age began because they were in that transition period. Whereas somebody who came along later with John's baptism, knowing only John's baptism like Apollos and later immersing people with that baptism, it was no good and they had to be reimmersed. And so God accepted some things a little different in the transition period. And so in the case of those people, they were immersed first and then came to have faith in Christ and then came to have their sins forgiven. Uh, during that, as that transition period unfolded. And I think that we have a similar situation, as best I can understand it, in the case of these Jewish vows and uh, Paul going into uh, synagogues and perhaps doing something more than just preaching a message there. And that during this uh, period of time between the cross of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem, we have a, a transition period in which it may have been permitted 
or tolerated by God or um, even accepted, perhaps we could say, for certain um, Jewish practices to run concurrent with Christianity until God finally removed the visible sign of Judaism as explained in, um, in Hebrews chapter 8. You might notice that the very right at the end of chapter 8 after you have that long quotation from Jeremiah 31 in which the new covenant is mentioned. Verse 13 says, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old, but that which is becoming old and waxeth aged is nigh unto vanishing away. Why didn't he say it already vanished away? Uh, because the destruction of Jerusalem had not yet taken place and there was a kind of a transition period here. That's the best I can come up with as to why Paul uh, took those vows. Some other brethren have taken the position that Paul did wrong in doing that, and I can't accept that. As I understood the question, it had to do with Paul and the men and the purifying themselves in the vow. Grave with Gary that certain things could be done that wouldn't conflict with Christianity. Uh, customs. And there are certain customs that they practice then. If they didn't want to eat meat, they didn't have to eat certain meat, but it'd be all right for the Gentiles that they want to eat the meat, things like that. And uh, so in that period of time, they had to be taught that you don't do that and try to get others to follow that. But there's not anything wrong if you want to do that. Now, I could be mistaken in what you had in mind. Uh, but that was the way I would think about it. In which case it's like uh, circumcision. Can I be circumcised without being guilty of following the old law? Yeah, I could. In Galatians, uh, you know, the second view that Gary mentioned that some of our brethren hold is that Paul sinned. He just did wrong, but he's not perfect. Perfect in doctrine, but not in his actions. Like Galatians 2, where Paul... Um, rebuke Peter to the face for his own conduct. Uh, I agree, though, that that's probably not the best view. I'm, I'm more to take what Perry's saying, that Paul could do things accommodatively. Remember, he uh, agreed to have uh, Timothy circumcised, but he refused to allow Titus to be. Well, either way he went on that was not a reflection upon whether or not he was trying to be submissive to the old law, but he was trying to open doors for people who did make an issue out of that. And I think we can do that today without being guilty of fellowshipping error. There are certain things that we can do because they're authorized for us to do, though it's not a matter of salvation. I think what Dave is saying would be based on 1 Corinthians 9, I've become all things to all men that I might by all means That I might so. win all men, yes. That's right. Paul's attitude, that he could do that. Next question. Okay, way back at the back. Uh, state your name and speak distinctly. My name is Tom Surratt. I'm from the Longview Church of Christ. What does the phrase, I was in the Spirit, mean in Revelation 1.10 when John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet? I didn't quite hear that. <laughs> Perry, would you interpret that for me? Would you state it one more time a little louder? What does the phrase, I was in the Spirit, mean in Revelation 1.10, when John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Praise, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What does that mean? Well, I would think it means exactly what uh, Peter said when he uh, spoke of some being moved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, that he was in... Um, in contact with the Holy Spirit, he was in a uh, reception mode for revelation, and the revelation came. And, uh, and then he unfolds the vision that he received. And we must remember the job of an inspired apostle, and uh, the Lord, perhaps I would say, let him permit it be pers persecution being put on the island of Patmos. If you have in mind the Lord's Day, I would think that the Lord's Day would refer to what we would call today Sunday. I believe according to the historians, they point out the fact that uh, the day of worship, the first day of the week, was also spoken of as the Lord's Day. And of course in Acts 20 we know they met upon the first day of the week to break bread. So I would say that this day was uh, the first day of the week. And John was over there 
as a prisoner or in persecution. He was not permitted to meet and to worship with the Christians on the first day of the week of the Lord's Day, uh, but he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day when these things began to be revealed to him. You might notice the similarity between how John stated that there and how Ezekiel stated um, an experience he had as he begins chapter 37, the dry bones chapter, where he says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And uh, so something supernatural was going on here. In other words, uh, and I think John means the same thing. Next question. Hello, Over I'm here. Jack Holder. Uh, I want to go back to this, if I can, about Jesus and God real fast. I do have a question. I was reading the other day in James 1, verse 13, where it says that God cannot be tempted. So when we say we're tempted, we should not say we're tempted of God. And yet Jesus was tempted. I think in the Greek, that word replying there, Jesus can, uh, God cannot be tempted. It simply means it is unable, absolutely impossible. It just cannot happen. But Jesus was tempted like we are and always, but yet he did not give in. So that's a distinct distinction between father and son. At least they were separated at that point. Now, that's, I'll just say that. Let me answer, ask you a question. In the Lord's, when Paul was talking about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. He's talking about us taking it in the proper manner and the proper spirit. And he says, if we take up the Lord's Supper, not discerning the body, we eat and drink damnation to our soul. Unto what body was Paul referring? Unto the body of Jesus or the body of Christ, body of Christ, the church? Was it, which one was he referring to? Question. Question pertains to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul gives us information concerning the Lord's Supper. And the one stands condemned who does not discern the body. So the question has to do, is that the, the body of Christ that Paul is speaking of or the congregation, the, the church itself? Well, on the first point that you made, again, the, the reference to Jesus being subject to being tested, I, that's good information, but it still doesn't deal with what we're trying to settle because that was when he was in his earthly condition. On 1 Corinthians 11, I'm convinced, I've read some of our brethren's attempt to defend the idea that body in 1 Corinthians 11 means the church. I'm unconvinced and I'm, I'm open to be convinced. I think he's talking about discerning the body of Christ on the cross, that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are to think about literally, physically, the sacrifice that Jesus made in our behalf. That's a good part of what should occupy our thoughts in addition to examining ourselves and so forth. I agree with what Dave said. Um, my earliest memory of somebody in the church um, making a case for this being the, um, the, the spiritual body, the church, uh, goes back about maybe 30, 35 years when I first uh, read someone make that argument. Um, like Dave, I'm unconvinced. If that is what it means, uh, I don't have any problem with that, if that's, if that's what we're to understand from that, but I don't really believe we are, and here's why. In verse 27, he said, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, if the blood means the literal blood of Jesus, then I think the body in the same phrase has to mean the literal body of Jesus. And since it's literal in verse 27, I have a little trouble switching over to a spiritual meaning so quickly when we get to verse 29 and read that whoever uh, eats and drinks, uh, eats and drinks judgment or damnation to himself if he discern not the body. I think he, he's referring to what he just said and therefore it is the literal body of Christ. Bill Brown from Portland, Oregon. And in smaller congregations where there are no elders, usually there is what is called a men's business meeting. But in a congregation, where they have business meetings, including all of the men that will come, but they also have deacons with no elders. And sometimes the deacons 
take the position or the authority to regulate, to make decisions, to discipline. And is this in keeping with God's word? This morning it was talked about our lives lived in a way to be pleasing to God and being pleasing to God also included our service to God. And of course deacons are to serve, but do they have the right in that situation? And is that proper in keeping with the uh, word? Bill's question pertains to a congregation where there are no elders. There are deacons there. I don't know about that, having deacons without elders, but nonetheless, that's the question. And would those deacons then have the right to sort of serve as the elders? In essence, that's the question. I don't think so, Brother Maxey. In the first place, I doubt the idea of deacons without elders. I think the Lord's order is elders and then there'd be deacons. It's true that certain individuals can help do things and they can meet together as brethren and make decisions and carry on the Lord's work before there are elders. I think the New Testament teaches there was the time when the congregation existed and then later elders were appointed or ordained. Now, as to how they got along in the meantime from the book of Acts, I don't know exactly. Uh, matters of expediency. Uh, but I do not think so-called deacons should sat up serve as elders and at the same time say we're not elders but we're just deacons. Uh, so I think we need to have some teaching in regard to the qualification and duties of elders and then have deacons and let the elders be the elders and the deacons then be special servants and work together in peace and harmony. Uh, I think that's a, that's a wonderful answer. Uh, my memory only goes back to uh, the middle of the last century. I can't remember back to the 19th century like Brother Cotham can, but uh, my first uh, memory of, of hearing of a congregation among us that had deacons without elders is, goes back about 40 years, maybe just 42 years. And I first heard that and I thought, boy, that's strange. And it was about the same time that I heard of one of our congregations appointing deaconesses. And I was in uh, college at the time, and so I asked one of my professors. Here he was walking down the hallway one day, and I saw him coming, and I had a ready question for him. And I said, uh, I said, let me ask you a question. Do you think we should have deaconesses in the church? And he said, that's the wrong question. He said, we have them. The question is, what should we call them? <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, I, uh, he was kind of smiling, and I, and I think uh, he, he didn't mean it in quite uh, the way that some could possibly take that. And I think what he was getting at is this. We, have, we appoint women to do various things, don't we? We appoint women to look after the, the, um, the nursery, uh, to uh, take care of the preparation of the uh, Lord's Supper, uh, and, and various other things, teach classes and, and things that pertain to women in particular. And yet, we don't have to give them a, some kind of a permanent official um, title like deaconess. And the same thing is true regarding men. If we had a congregation without elders, I think all three of us would agree that uh, you can appoint this man to look after the janitorial work and this other man to look after um, the organization of the Bible classes and, and so forth and, and uh, split up the work like that without saying you men are deacons in some kind of official sense of that term. And I think when they go into the official sense of the term and say we're appointing deacons but we don't have elders, that's when they made their first step down the road of trouble. Well said. Uh, if you think about it, God's, God's put this authority structure in the church and it, it commences with elders. But it's not unscriptural for a church to not have elders if a plurality of men are, are not uh, prepared to do so. Therefore, biblically, the next principle that would kick in would be male leadership in the church. So there's our authority for the men's business meeting. That's not a Church of Christ tradition that logically follows from the men leading the congregation when there are no elders. But to go beyond that then and start 
the bins business meeting doesn't have the authority to then single out individuals within that group and say you're going to function as an elder to we can get elders nobody should take to themselves the role of elder if they're not qualified and appointed to do so i wanted you to to comment on x six assuming those are deacons that that's at least a deacon like function in the church of jerusalem uh... did that precede elders in jerusalem uh, granted there were apostles there but those were apostles not elders wouldn't that be authority for there to be people officially appointed in a deacon like role and my point is even if that's authorized i saw this in south africa where they actually appointed some deacons and they didn't have elders but what actually happened was what the questioner suggested that the congregate they began seeing themselves as more than just a deacon as taking on some sort of an eldership role and the congregation is confused they begin going to those men for permission as if they are the uh, decision-making authority so that's even if it were authorized it would be very inexpedient and dangerous to do so Uh, I understood that, that question was two part. The next thing was, if there were no elders, could those who are serving is not necessarily deacons or that title, could they go ahead and carry out disfellowship within the congregation? The authority of those men without elders to disfellowship was that not a part of the question too? It was the deacons that made the decision. Uh -huh. their authority and uh -huh. Well, the, the Bible clearly teaches that discipline is to be exercised in the local church, whether there's elders or not. That's not necessarily tied. Obviously, if you have spiritual leaders, they would um, lead in that matter. But congregations that do not have elders ought to have a discipline program in effect and operative. And it's not dependent upon one person. It's dependent upon the power structure of the congregation, which, again, would be the male leadership of the church. Yeah, I just understood that, that was a part of the actual question and it wasn't dealt with. Uh, in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, which is really creeping into our great brotherhood, I recently visited a congregation within 50 miles of here who built a new building and they had all kind of a big entertainment stage set up and I asked them about instrumental music and they weren't using it in the Sunday morning assembly yet. But when I got in discussion with a young preacher and I won't mention his name, but he's well known to a number of people in this area. He said that Ephesians 5:19 and Colossians 3:16, where the word sing used, it was from the Greek word solo, which had to do with plucking the strings of either the heart or an instrument. And since it wasn't condemned in the New Testament, that that word solo would include even using an instrumental music. Using instrumental music. Now, some of you are experts in Greek, and I got my Vines dictionary out. And the word solo is not even the Greek word that's used in reference to the word sing anyway, is it? Isn't it the word melody that that word solo comes from? If so, it says the melody has to be made in the heart, so therefore it would eliminate the strings of an instrument. But did you know that they're using that word solo to try to justify instrumental music from even within the Lord's church today? And I'd like, uh, Gary especially is a language expert I know and probably either one, either three, but that word solo, when I looked in my uh, Vines dictionary, it had reference to the word melody and not even the word sing. The sing was a do, a do. And is it incorrect to use that word solo to try to justify plucking the strings of an instrument versus the strings of the heart? That's a long question, a long question to repeat. <laughs> we'll um, repeat the question. Uh, in keeping with the, the desires of Brother Cotham. The question re revolves around Ephesians 5.19, the Greek word solo. Does that include an instrument or would it be the heart? Or is it attached to the melody part? Okay. Concerning solo, saying psalms, hymn, the spiritual song, making melody, soloing in your heart to the Lord. That does include an instrument. Figuratively, it means from the heart, in the heart, from your heart, but not a mechanical instrument in that sense. It, that's the way the singing is to come from, uh, from the heart, with the heart, um, uh, with your thoughts and meaning in regard to the hymn that is sung. To say that an instrument is not included in one sense uh, is not true. Of course, it doesn't include a mechanical instrument like that, but it does mean that we sing from the heart, with the heart, in the matter. Now, I think that's the answer to the question that you asked. If not, I'm sorry, but that's what I thought you meant. Okay. 
Well, in various passages in the New Testament, we have the word sing, and that is the word solo, and also, by the way, um, the noun form uh, is uh, psalmos, the related form, the cognate of it. Um, and so it, it comes up in the New Testament, and it is germane to the question of what are we authorized to do today? And it is true that if, uh, if you go back to a classical Greek lexicon like Liddell and Scott, and you look up that word, uh, it will include um, plucking of strings. Uh, if you read uh, Thayer, he will acknowledge that it meant that, but then says in the New Testament it means only to sing. Uh, when one makes an argument like that, though, what he's, what he's doing is saying, well, look, at one time it, it meant to pluck strings like on a stringed instrument, therefore, we, therefore that's what it means in the New Testament time. That's, that's a, a rather inept argument because words change meanings. I, uh, I bought a book just uh, recently about English words that have changed in meanings. It's a rather thick book. I've just started reading it. I have it on my, my nightstand. I lie in bed holding the dictionary up like that as I uh, go to sleep at night. And um, some people think I'm crazy for reading dictionaries in bed, but I like to do that. Anyway, um, but long before I ever bought that book, you know, it came to my attention somewhere along the way that the English word lyric has changed in meaning. What did that mean originally? What is a lyre? It's a stringed instrument, isn't it? And, and therefore a lyric is, is words that are sung uh, as accompaniment to or being accompanied by a lyre. And yet if, if you ask a musician today, what, when we talk about the lyrics of a song, what are we talking about? It has nothing to do with instrumentation. It could be an a cappella song, and it has lyrics. And, uh, and therefore, the word has changed in meaning. And if you go into that classical lexicon, by the way, and go back to the most original usage of the term, it meant to pull your hair. And so if they're going to make that kind of an argument, I maintain they need to start pulling their hair in worship uh, nowadays. Isn't it uh, ironic, incredible, astonishing, and tragic that a young preacher would make that argument when our brethren discussed, debated, argued, and settled that matter a century ago. So, which tells you then our young fellows that are orchestrating change in the church today are not studying the Bible and studying the issues that have come up in the Bible. They're not. N.B. Hardeman, you remember, debated uh, Christian church pre preacher Ira Boswell back in 19, was it 20, 21, somewhere in there. And boy, old Boswell got up there and he was armed with all this classical Greek information about plucking and twanging and so forth. And Brother Hardeman got up there and said, I agree. But what you pluck is not inherent in the word any more than in baptizo. What you baptize or immerse in is inherent in the word. You can immerse in the Holy Spirit, water, milk, whatever. Baptize is just the action of immersion. So context has to stipulate what it is you're immersed in. And so it is with Psalo. And the text is clear in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. The heart is what is being twanged there. And so the uh, English translators translate it making melody, as Gary says, because it's, it's a figurative use. You can't literally pluck, the word heart is figurative, isn't it? I'm not talking about the blood pumpers, it's talking about the mind. You can't pluck that uh, literally. So here that's been settled for a century. I mean, the debate was over right there. And our brethren have settled that. And, and we've followed through and pointed out all the, uh, the foolishness. If, they, if he wants to contend that, the, whole, that uh, the instrument is in that word, then Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 are telling us everyone in the assembly to worship God must play an instrument. So it's, which way are you going to go on that? These are things our brethren have, have discussed and laid on the table long ago, and it's settled for those who are informed and will study God's Word. If we don't go back and read uh, the work that others have done, we're wasting all of that effort. You know, it, it doesn't mean that you have to 
read uh, somebody that said something or wrote something a hundred years ago, but if somebody did some good work on a subject and it's available and it's in print, why is somebody out here making arguments that, are, that have been answered long ago without going back and at least covering that ground and uh, doing their homework and then saying, well, here's where I take issue with what that man said. At least they ought to go that far before they start bringing up arguments as if they were never made before. In connection of what uh, Gary said, I would suggest the hardeman Bogart debate in Brother M.C. Curfee's book on instrumental music and worship are two good studies uh, that these uh, men uh, made. And then, too, if we study history, we have no uh, authentic account of instrument, mechanical instruments of music being used in worship until about the year 670, 700 A.D. And so the early Christians followed the teaching of the Lord. They made melody from their heart to the Lord in singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And that's what needs to be done today. And to add mechanical instruments of music would be an addition and unauthorized by the word of the Lord. A postscript we might put on this um, comes to mind. I have heard some brethren over the years say, well, yes, the, the word solo means to pluck strings, but in this case, the instrument is figurative. It's the heart, and therefore, we're pulling on the heart strings. Well, to me, that's, uh, that's going way too far to try to answer somebody's uh, argument. Um, and and it's unnecessary. Um, I heard a gospel preacher one time say, you don't want to put more harnesses on a mule than you absolutely need, otherwise you've got a hindrance instead of a help. And it's not a help to make that argument. Why? Because the word itself no longer meant to pluck anything by the time the first century came to pass. And therefore, we don't have to look for some object that we're plucking, uh, in this case, a, a, a figurative one rather than a literal one. It simply doesn't mean to pluck anymore. By the time of the first century, it simply meant to sing, and that's all the word meant. Let's say one other thing, Max. Yeah, I'm just, again, I'm just appalled that this kind of thing is going on among our younger people. If you go back 50 to 100 years and before, when our brethren got into discussions on religion with each other, with the even with the denominational world, they had enough savvy and Bible familiarity that we got into real discussions and got down to brass tacks and analyzed the text and figured out the truth. And our brethren generally won all those. Baptism, all the big issues, we won. We are at a time in our culture where not only have the denominations abandoned even wanting to argue and discuss what the Bible really said. They don't really care to get down and, and settle things because they're not there anymore. They're in a, in a feel-good religion mode. But what's tragic is so many of our people are. It's not that he just hadn't availed himself of that information. He's not interested in availing himself of that information. He's in a different ballpark, a different world, a different religion, serving and worshiping a different God. So we can't even have a debate and discuss it with him. I'm not interested in that. That's not where it's at with him. That's a shame. That means our culture is going down the tubes. I think the point that Dave made is excellent. In fact, I would like to expand on it to this degree. Some of those that are in what we might call the change agent camp seem more intent on trying to overthrow all of past knowledge that has been gained through hard study and work than in ascertaining the truth. They don't want to know, really. They, they want to do their own thing, and irregardless of what the truth says. Next question. Um, my name is John Baker. I'm a student in the School of Preaching as well. Um, your earlier discussion of the Trinity brought up a very practical question in my mind, and I'd like to address, uh, address it to you all. Um, I have heard brethren in the past argue that in our prayer life, we cannot address Jesus the Son in our prayers. And uh, I had taken that as being truth, uh, mainly based on his intercessory function, Hebrews 7.25, uh, other passages. Um, but I have recently been presented with the argument that 
Stephen in Acts chapter 7, towards the end of the chapter, as he was being stoned, uh, saw a miraculous vision into heaven. And as he was dying, as he was being stoned, the Bible says, I believe it's about verse 59 of Acts 7, that uh, he looked up and prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And I've heard it been addressed by, by brethren, as a matter of fact, that, uh, that this was actually him addressing Jesus in prayer. Therefore, we have authorization to do so. Uh, number, one, you need to read, number one, you need to read the Fort Worth Lectures from 1983, where Gary Workman spoke on that subject and answered that point. Number two, you need to stay awake in classes when we cover those things. <laughs> I'm teasing. John's an excellent student. Is so that, do you want to answer that? Is that book still available, by the way? Do you still have it here for sale? I think it's out of print, but we'll make a copy of I that. I think article. it's, um, this, the title of that one was the, um, uh, Name of Jesus. Well, the Personal Work of Christ, wasn't it? Personal Work Person of, Christ. Life of Christ. Personal we, Life of Christ. We have that volume, several yeah. copies. Like and, uh, Two dollars. Yes, yeah, so you can get a cheap answer there. Um, yeah, that was my uh, topic um, for the, the lectureship that year, and I, I covered that passage and, and others as well that people bring up, like uh, the Apostle John in Revelation is another favorite one to go to. Uh, a short answer to it would be this. Um, these men were in the spirit, if we can go back to John's uh, reference, like he said in, in uh, Revelation 1.10, they were in the spirit at that very moment in which the statements were made. Uh, Stephen looked up and saw the Son of God there. And, uh, and, you know, I contend that if you ever see Jesus, you go ahead and say whatever's on your heart. Uh, you're going to see him one day, <laughs> and uh, you'll need to speak up, as a matter of fact. And John, likewise, was uh, an inspired man, and was not only um, uh, saying something to Jesus, but was also talking to an angel. And, uh, and just as that does not give us the authority to pray to angels, neither does his conversation with the Lord give us any authority to pray to the Lord. So prayer is, uh, I don't know if you said this in the article, but comment on this, Gary. Prayer by definition is addressing deity when deity is absent from you in any sort of a physical or direct way. Yeah, it's absent. there's a difference between um, direct conversation like the apostles had and others with Jesus when he was on earth and prayer. And, uh, and I think everybody's familiar with the fact that Jesus said, you pray after this manner, our Father who art in heaven. Uh, he didn't say our, uh, the Son who is in heaven. And notice what Paul said, by the way, in Ephesians uh, 5 and verse 20, giving thanks always for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Now, if Paul said that we're to pray always for all things to the Father in the name of Jesus, then that doesn't leave any time left over and available for us to pray to, to Jesus directly or to the Holy Spirit as some would also contend. I, I was in an assembly, by the way, uh, just uh, as a visitor just not very long ago, a few weeks ago, in uh, which a man led a prayer, and there were about, uh, I guess, 12, 1,500 people. This was a large congregation. And a man led prayer and prayed to the Son in the name of the Father. And, uh, and it just goes to show how erratic some people are getting these days. So the next question is, well, what, what were so. you doing there? What was he doing at that? that <laughs> sorry, Perry, go ahead, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I didn't intend to interrupt. No, go ahead, Perry, I'm finished. I think some just want to be different today and do a different thing. It's still scriptural for me, I think, to pray to the Father in the name of the Son. But some also bring into the Holy Spirit some of these new uh, songs that some of the young people are singing today in some of their meetings. They pray to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And I, I, do, I don't like that. I don't approve of that either. So I, I agree with these others about that. My dad used to preach a sermon, the way that is right and cannot be wrong. And in that uh, thought, he always, you know, brought out, stay in that realm that you know is right. We know it's right to pray to God the Father through Jesus Christ because as Gary and, and the others pointed out, it's explicitly spelled out. 
where there is doubt on the other. So be right. Know you're right. And by the way, uh, it doesn't matter you know, if somebody brings up an argument that says, well, uh, Jesus can do things for us. Uh, he's our Savior. He's our King of Kings. He's, he's the head of the church. Um, uh, and maybe go to the example of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 or a passage like that. That's not an argument either for praying to Jesus because Jesus himself said, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I will give it to you. So the one doing the giving is not the one being prayed to. Next question. Next question. I'm Byron Nichols from Springfield, Missouri, and I want to go back to the instrumental music issues just to insert my observation that it's very disturbing to me that I hear so many of our brethren in the church say we don't believe in music in the church. I believe in music in the church, not instrumental music, but vocal music. Why should we get so caught up in this thing and get caught in the trap of saying we don't even believe in music. Our singing is music. We'd best believe in music in the church. I think that's a good observation. I'll, I'll try to emphasize that in my preaching. I'm sure these brethren do too. Uh, we do have music in that sense, vocal music, the kind that the Lord ordained. Going back to the sermon Sunday morning, gopher wood. It didn't just say make it out of wood, but they can't go for wood. And to add pine, hickory, and all that other would have been a violation to God's will in building the ark. And the same thing is true in regard to uh, items of worship. He said sing, so we sing. And he didn't say sing and play on mechanical instruments of music. No example of it, no command for it, be in addition to God's word. Now that's a good observation. question that was handed uh, me just now, and I'll address it to anyone on the forum. I know it is imperative to point out to brethren those who are wolves in sheep clothing, but is it not also sinful when brethren do point this out in sarcasm and hatefulness? Yep. Um, well, um, up here on, on the platform, by the way, uh, are some sample copies of, a, um, of the Restore publication that I've been editing for over 20 years now. Somewhere in the last few years, I want to say maybe it was um, three years ago, my son-in-law, Mike Vestal, wrote an article that I published. And I think the way the title was worded was, um, uh, when conservatism is not sound. And uh, he had some points to make along that very line. Um, and I have long contended that we cannot defend rudeness in the name of soundness. And, and there's got to be a difference. Anybody else? I don't think there's ever an excuse to be unkind or to be less than considerate. There's just no excuse for that. We're Christians, and when, even if we differ with someone, we can still differ in a, in a kind, gentle way. And I believe the service should be done decently and in order. As, as a worship service with reverence to God and, and the service of reverence. Not this uh, laughing and hand patting and waving of a hand and all that commotion. No, no, let's have a quiet, reverent, spiritual service to the Lord. I believe Brother Robert Dodson's next, and then we'll come to this gentleman over here. Comments in regards to the uh, Godhead question that we began with. Uh, the fact that the Bible teaches that there are three uh, persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that are each one of the same nature and essence that is deity or God uh, and that they play different roles one in subjection to the other one being commanded by the other uh, doesn't imply a contradiction I think a lot of people see that as a contradiction but uh, just like the, uh, the man and the woman for example 
of the same essence, of the same nature, or both human, uh, and yet they play different roles. Uh, it shows that uh, the nature of God can be the same way. And also in regards to the um, everlasting father of Isaiah 9, I would make the comment that uh, Jesus certainly was not his own father. He was an everlasting father, perhaps the words used in the sense of a patriarch. Uh, the, the Jews looked at uh, Moses and uh, you know other great men like Abraham as their fathers. But Jesus is the everlasting father uh, of God's people. That is, he is an eternal one. But uh, maybe some of those comments would help. <laughs> well, this is what's wrong, uh, or this leads, leads to what's wrong with the oneness view. Uh, just something you just pointed out. If, if Jesus was the father in the sense of his heavenly father, if, they, if he was the father in that sense, or if the oneness view were correct, where there's just one person in the, in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all just using three names for one being, that in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed to the Father, he was praying to himself. And uh, the uh, absurdity of that is something that really doesn't even need to be answered. And you, uh, back when we were discussing that, Gary brought up 1 Corinthians 11.3 that you brought up in the context of male-female relationship in the church. And that is an excellent point that uh, clearly there is a female subordination to male in certain settings, biblically, home and church, and yet in no way implying inferiority or superiority at all. That's not in consideration at all. So that, that is a good, in fact, uh, no doubt God choosing to create gender at creation. There were certain things he was reflecting about all of this relationship of human beings even to deity. Uh, George Kovalt from Baghdad, Arizona. Uh, there are some songbooks, especially one in particular, which has over a dozen songs in it, uh, most of them written rather recently, in which uh, that is a prayer in a song to the Holy Spirit. Now, as these creep into the songbooks, how are elders and leaders uh, to address those things? Should we not purchase uh, those song books? Should we uh, somehow highlight those songs in those particular books? And I have the evidence, and I, I didn't get it all from myself by any stretch of the imagination. Most of it comes from Brother Hugo McCord. And I have a number of, uh, I have the page numbers, the book numbers, and who publishes them. And I don't want to name that here out loud, but uh, I am disturbed. That publishing house also publishes a number of books and materials uh, of those that uh, we have heard referred to as change agents in the church. Uh, how far can we go in supporting that kind of material, those people? Well, since I mentioned that, I think, uh, I've read Hugo's article also, and I've looked through the Howard book uh, that he referred to, and I noticed those songs are prior to the... Uh... <laughs> well, it's not in this song book here. I know John who put out this book. Uh, but a lot of them are using that book and are singing those songs, and uh, Hugo and I have been friends for years. We went to school together at Freed Hardeman and you lost, and we were in class together. Anyway, he studied Hebrew as well as the Greek. Uh, he doesn't believe that we ought to sing those uh, songs addressed to the Holy Spirit and uh, Father. And I think uh, he asked what to do about it. Well, I think the brethren, the elders of the church, need to kind of go through that and mark those songs and say, let's don't sing those songs. Uh, uh, that would be my suggestion. Of course, we have a congregational oversight and appendance and all, so uh, that, uh, that would be my suggestion. I don't know what these other brethren would say about it, but that'd be my suggestion. Just mark some of those songs. I picked up a songbook one time a few years ago about the Jesus is coming soon. 
uh, you know, and then the verse said years ago, when you see these signs come to pass, well, there's no signs come to pass in regard to the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. He was referring in Matthew 24 to the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in AD 70, and uh, had a mark on that, do not sing. Uh, so I don't, I don't see anything wrong in brethren going through and say, just don't sing this song. Or by a rubber stamp as uh, the congregation in Adamsville, Alabama, where Bobby Duncan uh, preached for uh, such a long time, recently passed on. Uh, I did a gospel meeting there some years ago, and as I was sitting there on the platform just about ready to preach, we were singing a song just before the sermon, and I flipped uh, through the book to the song the song leader announced, I noticed uh, the rubber stamp that had been put on one of the pages that said, this song not to be sung. And the elders had had that done. And I think um, all of us sitting up here have our list of such songs, at least mental list, uh, and have a little talk with Jesus is number one on mine. Uh, but also Jesus is coming soon, as Brother Perry just mentioned, which is nothing more than denominational misinterpretation of Matthew Pre 24. Premillennial pre misinterpretation. Uh, in fact, the author wins it was a premillennialist. However, let me add one more thing. Um, <laughs> and, and just to make clear what I said, I, I think we should uh, not sing songs that are prayers to Jesus or the Holy Spirit, or songs that advocate praying to Jesus or the Holy Spirit. There are some songs that do that. They're, the songs themselves are not prayers, but they advocate doing that. Uh, but having said that, let me go on to say something else. There's a difference between prayer and praise. I maintain there's a difference between prayer and praise and that we can worship the Son. The Son is a candidate for our worship. And we can sing songs of praise to Jesus. But we need to ascertain the intent of the song and uh, somehow come to a conclusion whether this is a song of praise or a prayer. So uh, shepherds need to do their job. They need to either stamp it or uh, kindly and lovingly assemble all of the song directors of the congregation and, and discuss this with them, help them to see that, you know, we have a big responsibility here to lead a congregation of people in worship, and we need to make proper decisions on those things. Of course, I think we need to understand there are poetic expressions in poetry that we cannot use literal interpretation to, but it doesn't have to be unscriptural in its content of thought. I have a question right over here. My name is Sean Andrews. I'm from uh, Randolph Church of Christ in San Antonio. Uh, would it be all right if I made a comment before I asked my question? Uh, it's just a, something that I've noticed in my study, and it goes back to the idea of Christian discipline. All of the commands that I can think of that have to do with Christian discipline uh, are addressed to the church. I can't think of a single one that's addressed to elders, though by inference they should be involved. I just think that's an interesting observation. My question has to do with 1 Corinthians 14, and 34 specifically, and I, I apologize that I'm not a master like Jesus at asking questions. But he says about women keeping silent in the churches, he says they're not permitted to speak, but they're to be submissive, as the law also says. And in 35, he says, if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. It is shameful for women to speak in church. Now, not being a master at questions or at uh, the Greek, it seems to me that uh, we typically go to extremes in our approach to this thing. Uh, there is a terminology that I've heard about our, our corporate worship versus, I guess, what would be incorporate uh, worship. But I'm wondering about maybe there's some indication in the text about how much of us assembling together constitutes an assembly. Uh, there seems to be an indication, for instance, in 35 here in asking a question that that indicates a Bible study sort of setting. And yet my experience has said that we'll say, well, women don't need to have an active role in the worship assemblies per se. But for instance, in a Bible class assembly, that would be all right. I'm wondering if you could comment, is there a distinction here? Because the word translated church, as we've heard you know, so eloquently in these speeches, really means the assembly. I'm wondering if you could address that, please. 
gary and i may differ just a little bit if i remember his view on this but it's not anything that that affects where we come out on this thing but i believe can textually first corinthians fourteen is describing an assembly in which uh, miraculous gifts are being exercised. And that would automatically entail the one exercising that gift standing up and assuming a leadership role in that congregation. Women are forbidden from doing that in that setting. So the word laleo, the normal Greek word for speaking, is what is being forbidden there. She is not to participate in a leadership role in expressing these miraculous gifts of prophecy. If you back up earlier in the chapter, Men are forbidden to speak in the assembly. So the context shows he's talking about if you can speak in tongues, while one man is doing that, the other one is to be silent. That's the same word that's used to refer to the woman. So when speaking is used in Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, women are commanded to do that speaking, same word. So the speaking that's being forbidden in 1 Corinthians 14 is exercising a miraculous gift in a mixed assembly of adult males and females. And she is to speak in such an assembly when she is merely participating in the congregational singing. And then the word in 1 Timothy 2 that commands silence of women is a totally different word that's talking more about lifestyle and um, presence. So the Bible harmonizes perfectly as far as I'm concerned on all of those chapters. That would be my idea about it. First Corinthians 14 has to do with the use of these miraculous gifts in the assembly while they did last. And the woman speaking has to do with the teaching. They're not making the confession, not speaking and singing. We'll stay with the context in regard to speaking and to preach the truth. And as he pointed out, uh, man was to speak uh, one at a time and uh, if something be revealed to somebody else the man was to stop and let that be said uh, to the people and uh, let them listen of course these miraculous gifts have ceased but still the principle is true uh, in regard to the men doing the public teaching and preaching and uh, not the women and certainly she can make the good confession, certainly she can sing, and certainly a woman can teach other women because in Titus 2, the Apostle Paul said the older women teach the younger women. But uh, it didn't mean in a mixed assembly of men and women like this to get up in the pulpit on Sunday morning and preach a sermon. Usually these two brethren sitting on either side of me are right about things, but uh, in this case, uh, I have to take exception. Uh, I think the, the statements of 1 Corinthians 14 are to be understood and applied today just as they were in the first century, um, except for the fact that as Scripture reveals, uh, miracles are no longer with us. And so that part of it we have to, of course, uh, recognize is gone. But the, the principles of the chapter and the non-miraculous part of it, I think, uh, prevail on. I would point out that if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and beginning with uh, verse 17, uh, that Paul starts talking about the assembly. And, uh, and then when he gets to verse 20, he says, when therefore ye assemble yourselves together. And the assembly that he begins talking about there is carried on. The context simply remains until you get all the way through chapter 14. So that when you come over to chapter 14, verse 26, he says, what is it then, brethren, when ye come together, each one does this, that, and the other. Uh, so I understand uh, this to be the Lord's Day assembly in the same context beginning back there in chapter 11 and, um, and still applying today except for the cessation of spiritual gifts. And therefore, uh, how would I apply verse 34? Um, Dave's already pointed out that uh, the word keep silence is also used regarding uh, men, back in uh, verse uh, uh, 28, he said, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. And that didn't mean he couldn't say amen to the prayers or even lead one of the prayers. And it didn't mean that he couldn't sing. 
it meant that he could not function as a speaker on that occasion. And so when you get down to verse 34 and 35, and you read about how that women are to keep silence in the assembly, that's what it means as well. Some have said, well, if, it, if you take it literally, then she wouldn't be able to sing. She wouldn't be able to confess uh, Christ before baptism. She wouldn't be able to uh, whisper an amen at the end of a prayer, anything like that. And uh, that's taking it out of the context in which keep silence is used. Keep silence here means keep silence as a speaker. She cannot function as a speaker. Now, if we say that 1 Corinthians 14 is something that is entirely relegated to the past and disappeared in its entirety as far as any um, guideline for us today because of the fact that spiritual gifts are done away, then you no longer have any prohibition against a woman doing the very thing that Paul said not to do here. A woman can stand up right in the middle of uh, Maxie's sermon this coming Sunday and say, wait a minute, Maxie, I have a question about that and I want to ask you about this, 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 and this, and there would be no prohibition against it. I maintain that's still not right. Yeah, and, there, and therefore, 1 right. Corinthians 14 applies today, just as it did back in the first century. That right, Dave? Now, well, now tell Perry and I, and of course, if there's two of us that agree against one, we know who's right. But <laughs> tell Perry and I where we disagree with that. I, I agreed with everything you said. Well, I thought uh, you said that we disagreed. Uh, uh, well, I, I said <laughs> uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, some brethren are making the case that... Um, strictly that a miraculous setting and therefore... Strictly a miraculous setting. This is not our Lord's Day assembly. Therefore, you can't pull some verse out of here and apply it to what women can or can't do next Sunday. That's the argument well, some are making. And uh, they're using this argument, um, for the most part, I think uh, the occasion for it comes up in order to justify having women interpreters for sermons in the Lord's Day Assembly. I hold the position that that's not right based on what Paul said right here. She can't function as a speaker. And one of the, one of the speakers mentioned right here in the context was that of interpreter. And therefore, she can't function as an interpreter. She can't function as, as preacher or, or any of those speaker positions. And see, brethren are coming along saying, well, wait a minute, the whole of 1 Corinthians 14 is, is done away. We can't go to any passage in this chapter to say what women can or cannot do today. And therefore, she can function as an interpreter for sermons. Did you okay, catch what I he... bring in also 1 Timothy 2 and uh, verse 8, I will therefore that men, and that doesn't mean mankind, it means the men as we think of, not the women, pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And, and then down in verse 12, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to use up authority over the man, but to be in silence. Um, did you catch that Gary was saying a point that really needs to be made, Brotherhood, why? Because of all of the evangelism taking place in Russia and the Ukraine, all these places, we go over there and we can't speak the language, so we get local interpreters, and I, some of our brethren are using women that are locals to do that. But his point is, if God told the Corinthian congregation where you had women, Christian women, who were endowed with the miraculous gift of interpreting tongues, but if they were told they could not use that ability in an assembly of the church, what would make us think uninspired women today could interpret in the assembly? I think that's a valid and biblical point. I know the time has run out. I want to testify. <laughs> and all of my years of going to foreign countries and preaching and, and being translated in different languages, as I've just recently done, as... Uh, Maxie pointed out a moment ago, I have never had a woman to stand up in the pulpit by my side and give the translation for any sermon or for any class in any way whatsoever. And Perry, when did you ever first learn of any brother having a woman interpreter? How long when ago? When did I first learn of it? Yeah. Well, I don't remember. I'd be afraid to say. Just give, give, just give a just guess. Just recently. I'd say in the last few years. All right. In other words, 40 years ago when you were making mission trips, you didn't see brethren doing that. No, I did not. Aha. Uh -huh. I wonder why the change. <laughs> no, I did not. I wonder why the change. I maintain that, that all of our missionaries were practicing that 50 years ago. 
Somebody reinterpreted some scriptures sometime since. I hate to bring this to conclusion, but our time has expired. I see several hands up. We could be here for two more hours. And so we're going to bring it to conclusion. I want to thank uh, Brother Barry Cotham, Brother Gary Workman, and our beloved Brother Dave Miller for his pinch hitting for Hardeman. The next time you see Hardeman Nichols, let's all jump on to him about not being here.